Well, in the year 1516, a man named Erasmus published the Greek text of the New Testament of our Bible. 1516. Erasmus publishes the Greek text of the New Testament. That's the language that the apostles originally wrote the New Testament in. For years, they only had the Bible in Latin, in this translation called the Latin Vulgate. Erasmus produces this Greek New Testament so that people can read the original words that the apostles had written. And it's no coincidence that one year later, in 1517, Martin Luther nails the 95 Theses to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany, thus unofficially launching the Protestant Reformation. 1516, Greek text comes back. We get the Bible back to the people of God. 1517, the Protestant Reformation launches. And it's, I think, interesting at least to note that in 1515, coffee was first imported into the continent from India. So if you get caffeine, you get the scriptures, and you get a man who's studying the scriptures and a, a people that are studying them, God causes reformation. That's what happened in what we call the Protestant Reformation. And Michael Horton calls the Protestant Reformation the biggest back to the Bible movement in the history of the world. That's what the Reformation was all about. It was, let's get back to the Bible. What does God say about everything? And let's believe that. What does God say we must do? Let's do that. That's what the Reformation was. And that's how great Reformations have always happened in the history of the world. They always involve the rediscovery of the scriptures, uh, a rediscovery and fire in preaching the word of God, and rigorous application of the people of God to take the Bible and apply it to their individual lives. That's what happens with great reformations. They involve the rediscovery, faithful preaching, and rigorous application of God's word. It was true in Luther's day, and it was also true in the 7th century B.C. in King Josiah's day. Draw your attention to 2 Kings 22. In these two chapters, when King Josiah rediscovered the scriptures, God began to reform his life individually, and he began to reform the society of the nation of Israel as a whole. Therefore, what we learn from these two chapters in 2 Kings 22 and 23 is that if we want reformation in our day, we must, like Josiah, rediscover the scriptures and rigorously apply them to our lives in every aspect. That's what we have, that's what we have to have if we want reformation in our day as we need it. Now look at, look at 2 Kings 22, specifically these just few verses, verse 8, 9, 10, and 11. I want you to see here, the rediscovery of the scriptures is what is most needed for reformation. The rediscovery of the scriptures is what is most needed for reformation. If we want to be reformed to the image of Christ. This is what was true for Josiah. Look at verse 8 in 2 Kings 22. After Hilkiah the high priest, or and Hilkiah the high priest, said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. Now stop. Josiah the king had sent Hilkiah to the house of the Lord, to the temple, so that he could get all the money out of the treasury in the temple and that the workers there would build it back up and make sure the physical temple was healthy and in good shape. That's where God's glory shines forth from. So he sent them originally because the, the Spirit of God worked in King Josiah's heart, and he said the temple needs to be in good shape for God's glory. 
And when they go and are doing that and looking through for the money, apparently one of them next to the money finds the scriptures that had been hidden and lost for years because of the evil kings that had come before Josiah. So he sends them there and Hilkiah found the book of the law. And then he gives it to Shaphan and Shaphan read it. Now verse 9. And Shaphan the secretary came to the king. He came to Josiah and reported to the king. Your servants have emptied out the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workmen who have the oversight of the house of the Lord. So he's saying, King, we did what you told us to do. We went and got the money. We gave it to the builders and the workmen so that the, the temple can be in good shape. But now notice that in the sovereignty of God and the providence of God, he puts it in the heart of Josiah to rebuild the temple in this way. But God was doing something else. He was leading them right into the place where he knew his scriptures were and that had been overlooked. So that Josiah and the rest of the nation would rediscover the scriptures. Look at the kindness of God in putting it in Josiah's heart to go make the temple healthy. And then they, in this process, rediscover the scriptures. So verse 9, Shaphan tells the king, we did everything that you said. And now, verse 10, it's, and something happened that you did not expect. Verse 10, then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. That's all it takes. Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. We found a book. And you can imagine, how does that conversation go? What book? The book wherein God speaks to us. King, we found the scriptures. We found the very pages that were written down as God's word to us. So when we read them, God is speaking to us. We have the word of the Lord. Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And then verse 11. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. First of all, his response is lament and repentance. Because he realizes they have so long neglected the scriptures where God speaks and declares to them who he is, who they are, how they must live, how they can be forgiven of their sin. He sees that they had rejected or set it to the sidelines. It, it was collecting dust in the treasury rather than being right before their eyes every day. And so he tears his clothes. And this is what really propels the Reformation in Josiah's day. And the rest of this Chapter 22 and chapter 23 is just Josiah working to apply what the scriptures say. They tear down the high places where they sacrifice their children to Molech. They tear them down. They tear down the high places where they worship other false gods. They establish justice in the land. They start having the Passover again according to what God says in his word. Because they say, well, this is what God says according to how we should worship him. So let's do the Passover like we are supposed to. Let's go to war like we are supposed to. And so everything that comes later is just a rediscovery and application of what God says in his word. And that's what you and I should desire as well. In our lives individually, in the church, in our, in our families, in society, in our culture at large, we should desire everything to constantly be reforming to the image of Jesus Christ, who is the perfect Son of God, and to what is revealed in the Scriptures. We should want reformation according to what God says in His Word, always reforming to the Word of God. That's what we should want. And now before we get into the application of how we get that, or what we need to apply the scriptures to, I just want to ask simply, why should we desire reformation to the word of God? Why does it matter that God speaks in the scriptures and we must listen and obey? 
because simply God is our creator and sustainer. Why should we want to reform to what God says? Because he's our creator and he's our sustainer. Therefore, we must align ourselves how he says we are to be aligned. And if we are in Christ, he is also our redeemer and protector. And so we who belong to Jesus should doubly desire to reform our lives to the word because God has created us, he sustains us, and in Christ he has bled and died for us to redeem us and make us his people, a peculiar people for his own possession. So we belong to Jesus. So we should therefore desire to always be reforming to him in love and obedience. But who is this God? Who is this God that we need to reform to his word? Children, boys and girls, look up at my eyes. For just a few minutes, I want you to stare right at my eyes. Adults, draw your attention here. Who is this God that we must reform to? He is the God who has existed forever. He has no beginning and no end, eternally existing as one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Having eternally existed, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have forever in perpetuity been glorifying and enjoying one another before they even created the world. In the beginning of creation, God spoke and breathed out everything that exists. He spoke and everything came into existence. He breathed out the cosmos. He then separated the seas from the dry land with a word. He spoke and the sun shined to rule the day and the moon glowed to rule the night. He then later took dirt from the earth and fashioned it into the first man, our father, Adam, and then breathed life into his dead body so that he became a living soul. Then after creating all of the animals on the land and in the sea and in the sky and finding no helper fit for Adam, God then caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he took a rib from his side and he fashioned that rib into the first woman, our first mother, Eve. Then in this first marriage, God himself brings Eve to Adam and they enter into the covenant of marriage. He writes, their, he writes on their hearts his law so that they know what is right and what is wrong. Later, God comes to Job and reveals himself to Job, manifests his presence to him as a whirlwind. When God reveals himself to Job, he appears as, an, as a tornado. He later comes to Moses as a flame of fire, speaking to him from out of the burning bush. God came to the people of Israel in later times, covered in thick darkness and shaking Mount Sinai as he delivered to them his written law. He came later to Joshua as a warrior with a drawn sword prepared for battle. The Lord then reveals himself to Isaiah as one whose entire robe filled the temple who shook the foundations of the temple and whose glory was so splendid that when Isaiah sees him, Isaiah sees magnificent angels surrounding the throne room of God and God's glory is so bright that the angels must cover their eyes as they sing out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. He later appeared to the prophet Ezekiel as armored fire, as fire with metal armor around him. God finally perfectly came to us revealed in Jesus Christ. God became a human being. He added humanity, two natures, divine and human. 
He came to the earth about 2,000 years ago as a man, the God-man, to be our perfect representative and substitute to save us from our sin. Christ on the earth perfectly preached and revealed the holiness of God, who God truly is, because he's God in the flesh. He lived perfectly obedient to his Father, obeying the law every step of the way so that he could secure our righteousness through faith in him. He then went to a cross to be crushed by his Father in our place, taking our sins on his back. He died the death we deserve to die. He then came to arise from the dead, to break sin and death's neck and lay them on the ground. And then later to arise and ascend back to heaven to the right hand of God the Father, where he is now ruling, reigning, and protecting his people as our king. Jesus later then, after his ascension, came and revealed himself to the apostle John in the book of the Revelation, the last book in your Bible, and he reveals himself as one from whose mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. This is the one true and living God, perfectly revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our creator. He's our sustainer. He, for us in Christ, is our redeemer and our protector. This is the one who commands us in the scriptures. This is the one that we need to properly understand who he is so we can say, like Josiah, if we are not reforming our lives to the word, we would rip our clothes in lament and repentance. How dare I not always be reforming my life to what this creator and redeemer tells me to think and do? This is the God with whom we have to deal he is glorious, superb, splendid, magnificent, and you are not him. You are not God. You are not the king of your life. You do not get to decide why you exist. You do not get to decide what a fulfilling life looks like. You don't get to decide what you should think. You don't get to decide what you should do. You don't get to decide how to best enjoy God and glorify him. He decides, he reveals it in his word, and you and I must humbly submit to him and say, I want to always be reforming to whatever this God says. This is the God that we have to deal with. This is our God. This is why it matters that we would respond to the rediscovery of the scriptures like Josiah. And the rest of our life would be, how can I understand what God says and change whatever I need to change in my life to conform to what the Lord says? Because this is the God who speaks. Now, in application, how can we apply this truth for God's glory that we must rediscover and apply the scriptures? I want to point you quickly to eight things. If we want reformation in our day, we must rediscover the scriptures as they apply to each of us personally and individually. There's the first. If we want reformation in our day, we must rediscover the scriptures as they apply to each of us personally and individually. Now, as I make these eight points of application, I will fly by some of the verses rather quickly and then produce these notes for you so that you can look at them and study them on your own this week and you can really dig into each of these passages of Scripture, which I hope you will. But for the sake of time, I'm going to point you to these truths quickly and then I, I ask you, please dig deep this week and meditate on the Scriptures. First, though, if we want reformation, we must rediscover the Scriptures as they apply to each of us personally and individually. What I mean by that is we must first point the sword of the Spirit at ourselves. Take the Word of God, turn the sword towards yourself first before you would point it at your church, 
or your family or your job or the public square or the civil government or great evils or purity of doctrine, before you point it out, point the sword towards yourself, like Christ tells us in Matthew 7, 3 through 5. Matthew 7, 3 through 5. He says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. If we want reformation, we have to start with ourselves and say, what does God's word say about me, what I should believe, what I should do, how I can have my sins forgiven in Christ, and don't you dare look out before you look in. There's the, the first principle. Apply it to yourselves. Are you personally and individually reforming to the scriptures? Reformation started in King Josiah's day because he first ripped his clothes. He first applied the scriptures to himself. And then it goes out from there. And that's what you and I must do. Take the log out of your eye. I must take the log out of my own eye. Look at myself. Examine myself. And only then can we look out and even help others. Second, if we want reformation... We must rediscover the scriptures as they apply to the church. We must rediscover the scriptures as they apply to the church. Simply, the church must preach the word, like Paul commands in 2 Timothy 4. We must preach the whole counsel of God, like Paul's example in Acts 20.27. The church must sing the word. As Paul says in Ephesians 5, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The church must pray the word according to how the Lord Jesus teaches us to pray in Matthew 6. According to the example laid out for us even in the psalms, this collection of songs and prayers to God. The church must rediscover how to pray This is maybe one of the biggest needs in even Reformed churches who have this constant reminder, we always reform to the Word of God. I listen to many prayers by Reformed people and think, you have no idea how to pray. You're only praying about events and things in your life that you want to change. You go and look at the Apostle Paul's prayers and you will never See him asking for his external circumstances to change. Never! He only asked and prays for his heart to change and to love Jesus more. He's never just saying, well, I hope God will change this in, in my external, in the culture or something. He's not asking for his circumstances to change as much as he's asking for his heart to love Jesus more and the saints to hate their sin more and glorify God no matter what happens. And so he says, I've learned the secret of being content. I can be rich or poor. I can be persecuted or elevated. I've learned to be content with everything and to seek to glorify God in everything. We need to learn how to pray and what to pray for even. Yes, we should pray for those who are sick. We should pray for those to be saved. But we shouldn't, and what I mean by external circumstances is we're we're always, it seems, many people are always praying just for God to intervene in some miraculous way and change our circumstance rather than change our hearts. We need to learn, be guided by the prayers that are laid out in the scriptures to even see what holy and good prayers even look like. We must preach the word, sing the word, pray according to the word. The church must baptize according to the word. Acts 8, 12, when they believed Philip, when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. 
When they believed, they were baptized. We need to baptize according to what the scriptures say. We need to feast according to what the scriptures say. And by that I mean take of the Lord's Supper, where we feast on Christ through faith as we take of the bread and the cup. In our hearts, we're feasting on the Lord Jesus. We need to do that according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six, As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The church must fellowship around the word. We must have holy fellowship with one another, and it's always centering around God's revelation to us in Scripture. Acts 2.42, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. The church needs to fellowship around the word. The church must practice church discipline according to the word. As Christ lays out for us in Matthew 18, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. But if he does not listen, if he won't repent, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Consider him that he's an unbeliever. A church needs to practice church discipline according to the word when necessary. And the church must, to always be reforming and applying the scriptures, the church must equip the saints with the word. Equip the saints to be obeying Christ and glorifying Christ from Sunday to Sunday in our lives, not just when we gather together. Paul tells the church at Ephesus concerning the whole church that Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Your pastor's primary job is to equip you to go out and minister to other people in the name of Jesus in all of life. Concerning the men in the church, Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2, What you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Concerning the women, specifically, Paul tells Titus in Titus 2, 4, and 5, the older women are to train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. The church In order to constantly be reforming, we need to preach the word, sing the word, pray the word, baptize according to the word, feast on the Lord's Supper according to the word, fellowship according to the word, practice church discipline, and equip the saints for the work of ministry. That's our job. The church is a collection of living stones. A collection of living stones, and we must make sure that all of us, as living stones, are stacked in the way that the builder of the house says they must be stacked. Christ owns us, so we must organize and function in the ways that he says he wants his stones of this spiritual house that is the church to be built. Is our church always reforming to the word of God. Are you as an individual member of this local body, are you seeking to always be reforming to the word of God and encouraging the whole church to be doing that together? We must. If we want reformation, we must rediscover the scriptures as they apply to the church. But not only that, 
We must rediscover the scriptures as they apply to our families. If we want reformation in our day, we must rediscover and apply the scriptures as they apply to our families. We must have our homes structured like the scriptures say, with the husband functioning as the head, the wife as his helpmate, and their children as those being trained up to be godly. That's the way God says the home must be structured. The husband actually functioning as the head. Husbands, you are the head of your wife. You are the head of your household. But my question is, are you functioning as the head? Wives, you are the helpmate of your husband. You are the helpmate of your husband. Are you functioning as his helpmate? Or are you trying to usurp the authority that the Lord has given him and you're trying to be the leader? You are the helpmate. You must function as that. Children, boys and girls, God tells you to obey your parents in the Lord. And that even specifically your fathers are to be training you up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Husbands and future husbands, look at me. Ephesians 5, 22 and 24. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, you are the head of your household. You are responsible for the provision both physically and spiritually. The buck stops with you. Function as the head. Wives and future wives. Listen to Genesis 2, 20 through 22. For Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he fashioned into a woman and brought her to the man. Wives and future wives, this is your glorious calling to be your husband's helpmate. That doesn't communicate that you are inferior. It communicates that we as men need help to fulfill our role and duties, even in the home. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Ephesians 6, 1-1. Honor your father and your mother, Ephesians 6, 2. Boys and girls, your house is a training ground for you to become more like Jesus. And mom and dad exist to train you up. We have to have our homes structured like the scriptures say, with the husband functioning as the head, the wife functioning as his helpmate, and the children as those being trained up to be godly. But... If we want reformation, applying the scripture to our homes means that we must recover family worship in our homes. We have to rediscover what the church in ages past knew. That we are to worship God together in our houses. As Israel did. As they did in the Reformation. As they did in the Puritan era as they even did in the 1800s and the early 1900s, until it just faded away and ordinary Christians passed off all of their spiritual duties to the organized local church. It must not be so with us. We have to rediscover and recover family worship in our homes. Like Joshua in Joshua 24, 15, we must resolve, as for me and my house, we will worship the Lord. And by that he meant daily, not only in the assembly of the saints. You and I must fear 
to be named among those who act like they do not know God. We should be terrified of Jeremiah 10.25, where the prophet says to the Lord, Pour out your fury and wrath on the nations that know you not, and on the families that do not call on your name. We need to recover family worship because the Lord is worthy of worship, not just in the assembly of the saints, but every day together in our homes. What a kindness that God would bless us with families. What a kindness that he would bless us with families. And furthermore, then even tell us how our families must be organized so that we can enjoy him and glorify him. Psalm 127 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. We must trust the Lord to build our house or all of our labor is for nothing. Are you, are you in your families, specifically this has to deal with you heads of households, are you in your families constantly reforming to the word of God as to what he says your family should function like? The next, the next point that I want to make concerning Reformation is that if we want Reformation, we must rediscover the scriptures as they apply to our vocations. Our vocation means your job, what you do. First, we need to remember, or maybe learn for the first time, that there is no sacred and secular distinction. And what I mean by that is, there's, there's no job that is, this is a sacred job, and this one is just a secular job. That doesn't exist in the scriptures. If you're in Christ, whatever your vocation is, is a sacred vocation. It's not like me, I'm a full-time preacher, pastor. That's a sacred vocation. And you might be a, a teacher or an accountant, and that's secular. No. No. That doesn't exist in the scriptures. Every one of our vocations, our lawful vocations, is work that is serving, worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 3, 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You, in your ordinary vocations, your jobs, you are serving the Lord Christ. You've got to rediscover that your job matters and you are to work in your job for Jesus, for his glory. And we need godly people in all types of jobs all over our society for the glory of God and the good of our neighbors. There is no sacred or secular distinction when it comes to our vocations. We are all serving the Lord Christ. Now to make a couple of clarifications, the primary work for a man is outside the home, providing food and shelter and other necessities for his wife, his children, and even relatives who need it. God put Adam in the garden to work it and keep it. And when they fell into sin, part of the curse was that now his work would be hard. God put Eve in the garden to primarily work within the home, to work raising up the children and loving her husband. That's why <clears throat> when she is cursed for her sin, childbearing becomes hard. The man's primary work is outside the home, providing for his family. And the woman's job is primarily in the home. 
1 Timothy 5, 8, men, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. It's your job, men, to go win the bread. All the bread. Your wife, it's not her job to win one bit of the bread for your house. It's not her responsibility. It's your responsibility. Women, you who are married, and especially you who are mothers, the primary work for a wife is at home, being a helpmate, loving her husband and children and relatives. Titus 2, 3 through 5, older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Children, boys and girls, look at me. When you grow up, whatever job you get, whatever job you get, you will be serving the Lord Jesus Christ in that job. And you are to work for Jesus as hard as you can, as best as you can, according to how he's made you. And you do it serving Jesus, even in your ordinary job. Children, think about the job that your dad has, even right now. What's your dad go and do every day when he leaves the house to go work and provide food for you? Wherever he goes, he's doing that as a servant of Jesus and serving Jesus in his job. And children, your, your mothers who stay at home with you and work at home with you, they, that is their job that God has given them. And they are serving Jesus, children, as they raise you up and take care of you in the home. This is the calling of husbands and wives. What a mercy that God would make even our everyday duties in our vocations something that we are explicitly serving him in. Isn't that great? You work more than you do anything else. You work more than you do anything else. I think most of you men, you probably work more than you sleep. You work more than anything else. And so isn't it refreshing and delightful to remember that every bit of my vocational work, I'm serving Jesus. I don't have to get my work done so I can serve Jesus. I'm serving Jesus even in my ordinary job. You do not ultimately serve your boss. You serve the Lord Christ. And he always deserves a good day's work. You women who stay at home. You've stayed at home to take care of your children and primarily focus on them. You are serving the Lord Christ. You're serving Jesus in your job. You have one of the hardest jobs of anyone. And you don't really get time off. Remember, every second of the day, Jesus is your boss. And he deserves a good day's work. He's glorified by your vocational work. So are you, in your vocation, individually, are you, each of you, always reforming how you think and how you work and saying, I serve Christ in this job. How does he want me to serve him? How can I best glorify him in this job? Ask that question of yourself. Fifth, if we want reformation, we must rediscover the scriptures as they apply to the public square, to how we function in public, and even how we talk to people in society. I mean, outside the walls of the church, outside of your community group meeting, but when you go into the culture, we as believers, I think in this day especially, we need to rediscover what the scriptures have to say about how we function in public. You and I need to be like Paul, who boldly walked into the middle of the city 
and proclaimed the kingdom of Christ and called everyone in the Areopagus in Athens to repent and trust in Jesus. Because Jesus is king and he's going to judge them for their sin if they don't turn to him in faith. We need that kind of boldness. How many professed Christians live as though the truth of the gospel, we focus on it when we gather for worship or in our Bible studies or in our families, but in society, in the public square, people may not even know you're a believer. It shouldn't be so among us. We shouldn't be scared to go into the public square and like Paul say, Christ is king. God has given evidence of this by raising him from the dead. And he has fixed the day that he will judge the world in righteousness by this man, Jesus Christ, that he has appointed. So repent and turn to him in faith. He'll forgive you and cleanse you. We need to rediscover that activity in the public square and tell everyone that Christ is king. You and I also need to proclaim the gospel explicitly, not just proclaim the kingdom of Christ in the public square, but we need to proclaim the gospel in the public square, compelling people to come to Christ for salvation and to come into the church for holiness. In the parable of the wedding feast, Christ says in Luke 14, 23, the master said to the servant, go out into the highways and the byways and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. We need to proclaim the kingdom of Christ in the public square. We need to proclaim the gospel and tell people to come to him and come into the church in public and not be scared that Christ is king. There is more than enough room at the wedding feast of the Lamb of God. Go invite others into Christ and into the church so that they can feast on the blood-bought promises of Jesus and they can seek to glorify Jesus along with us. We need to rediscover and apply what the scriptures have to say about our involvement in public. Sixth. If we want reformation, we must rediscover the scriptures as they apply to the civil government. We need to know who our leaders, why God has instituted civil governments. And in Romans 13, he says, he instituted civil governments, all those in any kind of civil government sphere, from sheriff all the way up to president and everybody in between, he instituted them as his servants, they belong to him and must obey him. And their primary job is to uphold the good and punish the evildoer. Uphold the good, punish the evildoer. This is what Romans 13, 3 and 4 lays out. Christ's servants must obey their master. Protecting the good and punishing the evil or it will not go well for them on the day of judgment. We need in our day to rediscover what God actually says about civil government. And I think if we did that, I think many faithful believers would say, you know what, I should run for office. Because if, if they're supposed to be servants of Christ and obey him, I know Christ. I want to obey him. I want to do what is right. I want to protect the innocent, the good, and I want to punish or at least threaten the punish with or threaten the evildoers with punishment, like God says. I think more Christians would actually stand up so that we would have a just society. Are you personally reforming your understanding of what the role of civil government is according to God's word? Seventh, if we want reformation, we must rediscover the scriptures as they apply to combating great evils in our culture. We must rediscover the scriptures as they apply to combating great evils in our culture. We must work to abolish evils by seeking justice 
and correcting oppression, not by seeking compromises or regulating oppression. Hear the word of the Lord in Isaiah 1, 16 and 17. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good. Now here it is, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. We need to work to abolish evils, such as abortion, by seeking justice and correcting oppression, not by seeking compromises or regulating oppression. Because God says, what a grace that God would make explicit in his word how we are to engage in even a battle so great as child sacrifice. His word is sufficient to guide us and direct us concerning how we combat great evils in our culture. Just as the Lord abolished chattel slavery and man-stealing, so he will abolish abortion sooner or later. Don't give up. Until justice is established, your pre-born neighbors are protected, therefore abortion is criminalized. Don't give up till that happens or you're dead. Seek justice, correct oppression. Eighth, and finally, if we want reformation, we must rediscover the scriptures as they apply to how God saves sinners. How God saves sinners. We must all, and even repeatedly, rediscover that God says in his word he saves sinners by his sovereign grace alone from beginning to end. Paul says in Romans 8, 29 and 30, for those whom God foreknew, that means he set his delight on, he foreloved, he chose, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus, in order that Jesus might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. From beginning to end, salvation is, as Jonah said, salvation is of the Lord. We have to rediscover that. Boys and girls, you cannot save yourself. You cannot even make yourself go to Jesus and trust in him. God has to save you. God has to enable you to even see your sin for what it is and trust in the Lord Jesus to redeem you. Adults, it's the same for you. Salvation is of the Lord from beginning to end. Not one link in God's good golden chain of redemption can ever be broken. And beloved, you who trust in Jesus, hear me. Because God's salvation is so secure in his sovereign hand, if your faith is in Jesus, your future glorification, that he will preserve you to the end and make you perfect one day with and like Jesus, that is more of a certainty than if you will wake up from sleep tomorrow morning. You are more sure to be glorified on that last day than it is sure that you'll even get out of bed tomorrow. God will do it. What a kindness that God would reveal to us why all things work together for good for his people. Because of his sovereign grace. And why nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Because he is providentially and sovereignly working for his people's salvation from beginning to end. Are you personally reforming your thinking, your evangelism, your discipleship to what God says in his word about how he saves sinners? You and I must. Now, in conclusion, 
Let me just ask you this so you can think for a second. How has this sermon affected you? I've, I've hit the nail pretty hard, and I keep hitting it, and keep hitting it, and keep hitting it. We must obey Christ. We must be reforming to the word of God because of who he is and what he's done for us. How has that affected you? Does it feel like a burden or does it feel like delight? Does it feel to you individually like, oh my gosh, I've got all this stuff I've got to do. Or I'm so guilty because I, I haven't done any of this. If that's all it is, if it's a burden to you, I'm afraid that's probably the clearest way that you know you are not a Christian. If all of these directions and commands of the Lord to how we should be reforming are just a burden to you, you're not a Christian. But it's revealing to you that you don't obey Christ as you should, and your sin is great, and you don't even want to obey Christ. Because when you hear all these things that we must do, it's not, okay, that's how I enjoy and glorify Jesus. That's how a Christian responds. But an unbeliever responds with, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Eight different ways I need to reform myself? You need to look at that, and if you feel that burden, realize that God is revealing to you that your sin is great, and you still need to be delivered and forgiven of your sin. You can go to Christ right now, and that burden, if you are feeling that burden, Christ can lift it off. He can forgive you of your law breaking. He can forgive you of the fact that your heart, even right now, doesn't want to reform to the word of God. He can take your sin away. Trust in him and his cross and what he's done to pay for the penalty of sin, to break the power of sin. If you go to Christ right now and trust in him, turn from your sin and say, save me, save me, and trust in his work. He will receive you. But those of you, do you hear these things? And though it reveals you're still indwelling sin and how much you need Jesus, ultimately it's a delight to say, all right, here's how I can glorify God. Is it a delight to you? And praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that he has changed your heart so that you no longer would hate his law, but you would sing like David. I love your law. It is my meditation day and night. Tell me what to do so I can glorify you. Has God saved you from your sin and reconciled you to himself through Jesus Christ? If not, you need to just look at the cross and if he has saved you in Christ, you need to again look at the cross. 1 Peter 3.18 Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. This is the good news of the gospel. Christ died for rebels like me and like you. So that we could not only be forgiven, but we could be empowered and live all of our life for his glory and always be reforming to his word. Do you want that? May God be gracious to us so that we would be a church and individuals and families and a society that's always reforming to the scriptures. Pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we ask you to convert those who are not yet in Christ. And they know by just hearing these ways that we should be reforming to your word. They know by the burden they feel that they do not want to obey you. And they are still dead in their sins. We ask you to lift that burden off of them by giving them faith in the Lord Jesus. So that they would trust that what he did on the cross for them would fully satisfy your judgment and provide their forgiveness. 
Help them to see the perfect law-keeping of Christ, that he obeyed perfectly as we have not, so that we would be counted righteous before you if we trust in him. Cause them to be born again, Lord, we ask. Save sinners. Save our children for Christ's sake. Sanctify those of us who are already in Christ. Give us delight to hear your word and see how we can be reforming to best glorify you and enjoy you. Help us to be always reforming to your word. Like Josiah, we ask you to bring a reformation in our lives, in this church, in this city, in this state, in this nation, in your world. Bring a reformation and revival so that it would glorify your name. Cause it to happen, Father, in a way that it would be so clear to all of us that you did it. Cause reformation to come for your glory. We ask you to abolish abortion. We ask you to establish justice in our land and protect our preborn neighbors. Please rescue the children that are being carried off to death as we go and preach the gospel and plead with parents. Sanctify your saints. Purify your church. We ask all of this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.